So we're going to start right away with today's Torah portion. <clears throat> so it's, today's Torah portion goes from Genesis 25, 19 to 28, 9. And we're not going to go through the whole thing because obviously it's a few chapters long. But let's start at Genesis 25, 19, and we'll start to paint a picture. <clears throat> so it starts talking about how, and this is the history of descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. 21, and Isaac prayed much to the Lord for his wife because she was unable to bear children, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, became pregnant. Two children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is so that the Lord has heard our prayer, why am I like this? And she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, the founders of two nations are in your womb, and the separation of two peoples has begun in your body. The one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth, and his hand grasped Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob, which is supplanter. Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a cunning and skilled hunter, a man of the outdoors. But Jacob was a plain and quiet man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved and was partial to Esau because he ate of Esau's game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Jacob was boiling lentil stew one day when Esau came from the field and was faint with hunger. And Esau said to Jacob, I beg of you, let me have some of that red lentil stew to eat, for I am faint and famished. That is why his name was called Edom, which is red. Jacob answered, then sell me today your birthright, the rights of a firstborn. Kind of interesting when you, when you see that. But Esau said, see here, I am at the point of death. What good can this birthright do me? Jacob said, swear to me today that you're selling it to me. And he swore to Jacob and sold him his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau scorned his birthright as beneath his notice. We're going to get back to that in a moment. And then it goes on in 26 where it talks about, and there was a famine in the land other than the former, former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And it goes on, you know, interesting that, that uh, Isaac followed the same pattern with Rebecca as, as Abraham did with Sarah. You know, tell Abimelech that you're my wife because you're so beautiful. I mean, your sister, because you're so beautiful, they find out, you know, they'll kill me and all. You know, interesting how the same story took place with Abraham, Abraham and uh, Sarah. So let's go verse to jump to, and then it goes through the wells, you know, Isaac with the wells and, and digging them all up. The Philistines, you know, covered them with the dirt, and Isaac went and dug another well, and we know the whole story about that. But let's go to, ver to chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his elder son, and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. And he said, See here now, I am old. I do not know when I may die. So now I pray you, take your weapons, your arrows and a quiver and your bow, and go out into the open country and hunt game for me, and prepare me appetizing meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat of it to giving you my blessing as my firstborn before I die. But Rebekah heard what Isaac said to Esau, his son. And when Esau had gone to the open country to hunt for game that he might bring it, Rebekah said to Jacob, her younger son, see here, I heard your father say to Esau, your brother, bring me game and make me appetizing meat so that I may eat and declare my blessing upon you before the Lord before my death. So now, my son, do exactly as I command you. Go now to the flock, and from it bring to me, bring me two good and suitable kids, and I will make them into appetizing meat for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father, that he may eat and declare his blessing upon you before his death. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Listen, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Suppose my father feels me, I will seem to him to be a cheat and an imposter, and I will bring his curse on me and not his blessing. But his mother said to him, On me be your curse, my son. Only obey my word and go fetch them to me. Now interesting that Rebecca said that to me, that on me be the curse, my son. And we'll see something about that in a moment. 
So verse 14, so Jacob went, got the kids and brought them to his mother and his mother prepared appetizing meat with a delightful odor, such as his father loved. Then Rebecca took her older, elder son Esau's best clothes, which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done what you told me to do. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may proceed to bless me. And Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found the game so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God caused it to come to me. But Isaac said to Jacob, Come close to me, I beg of you, that I may feel you, my son, and know whether you really are my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, and his father felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He could not identify him, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. So interesting. He questioned, and it says right there, he could not identify him. So he wasn't exactly sure, is this really Esau or is this Jacob? He couldn't identify him, but he proceeded to go ahead and bless him. Verse 24, but he said, are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then Isaac said, bring it to me and I will eat of my son's game that I may bless you. He brought it to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him and Isaac smelled his clothing and blessed him and said, the scent of my son is as the odor of a field which the Lord has blessed. And may God give you of the dew of the heavens and of the fatness of the earth an abundance of grain and new wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Bow down to you. Be master over your brothers and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Let everyone be cursed who curses you and favored with blessings who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, Jacob and Jacob was scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Esau had also prepared savory food and brought it to his father and said to him, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said to him, Who are you? And he replied, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled and shook violently. And he said, Who? Where is he who has hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate of it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with a great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. Isaac said, Your brother came with crafty cunning and treacherous deceit and has taken your blessing. Esau replied, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now he has taken away my blessing. Have you not still a blessing reserved for me? Now, in essence, he did not take away his birthright. Esau gave it to him very willingly for a pot of stew, okay? So he did not take his birthright. And Isaac answered Esau, Behold, I have made Jacob your Lord and master. I have given all his brethren to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up, could not control his voice, and wept aloud. Then Isaac, his father, answered, Your blessing and dwelling shall all come from the fruitfulness of the earth and from the dew of the heavens above. By your sword you shall live and serve your brother. But the time shall come when you will grow restive and break loose, and you shall tear his yoke from off your neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The day is of mourning for my father very near. When he is gone, I will kill my brother Jacob. These words of Esau, her elder son, were repeated to Rebekah. She sent for Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, See here, your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. So now, my son, do what I tell you. Arise, flee to my brother Laban and Haran. Linger and dwell with him for a while until your brother's fury is spent. When your brother's anger is diverted from you, he will forget the wrong that you have done him. Then I will send and bring you back from there. Why should I be deprived of both of you in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. 
those wives of Esau, if, you, if Jacob takes a wife of the daughter of, of Heth, such as these Hittite girls around here, what good will my life be to me? So then in chapter 28 says, So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, You shall not marry one of the women of Canaan. And then goes on to say, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you until you become a group of peoples. May he give the blessing he gave to Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land he gave to Abraham in which you are a sojourner. Now it goes on and ends in, in verse 9, but I'm going to stop there. And for a second... For a few minutes, actually, not a second, but for a few minutes, I'm going to focus on Esau and, and uh, Jacob. That's not the full thing we're going to talk about, but I just wanted to point some things out with that story, with Esau and Jacob. So interesting, you know, when you go back to the whole birthright thing, um, actually, let me go back to Genesis 26. In Genesis 26, 34, it says, Now Esau was 40 years old when he, took, when he took his wife, Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Huh? Genesis 26, 34. And then 35, And they made bitter, life bitter in a grief of mind and spirit for Isaac and Rebekah. Now you catch that. Esau married these two, had these two wives, and it says right there that they made Isaac and Rebekah's life bitter. They made it life bitter and grief of mind and spirit. So interesting, you know, in a perfect world, you know, when you look at Gen in Genesis, it tells us that Esau despised his birthright. Now, as the firstborn, you know, obviously as the firstborn, you're supposed to be receiving the blessing. But there's a key right there where it says Esau despised his birthright. So when you look into that further, so if he despised his birthright right from that start, then his responsibilities as the firstborn son weren't important to him. Think about it. If he so easily despised that, his responsibilities as a firstborn son didn't make any difference to him. It was like, oh, well, I get it, I get it, I don't, I don't. And he was likely to neglect them. Okay, now I'm talking, this is a perfect world. I'm painting a picture here. So, but in essence, he was likely to neglect them. Jacob, on the other hand, was hardworking and ambitious. He was much better suited to assume the leadership of the Israelite family as it began growing rapidly into a group of tribes that would become a nation. So you had Esau, who didn't care much about anything, but you had Jacob who took leadership seriously. So ideally, what you would think would have happened, because Esau recognized this and he recognized what was in Jacob and he didn't care much about anything himself, ideally you would have thought that Esau would have recognized Jacob's abilities and he would have recognized his own disinclination and offered Jacob the role of family leader voluntarily. But obviously this is not what happened, okay? Now that's what you would think would have happened, but that is not what happened. So Jacob, in another sense... You know, he was very wise and knew what he was doing, but he had his mother to help him, okay? And we're going to focus on Rebecca in a second. But in Jacob's case, he took advantage of a weakness in Esau's character. The book of Hebrews describes Esau as profane, which means literally that nothing was sacred to him. So if he's described as profane, if nothing was sacred to him, then obviously his birthright was not sacred to him. His responsibilities as being the firstborn was not sacred to him. And he was not going to uphold that position if it had been given to him as Yahweh had intended. But Yahweh knew Jacob would uphold that position. So there's the whole question about, okay, but Esau was the firstborn. So one day, you know, like I said, one day Esau comes in and, and he's famished from hunting and Jacob is making the stew and he gives him the stew and stuff and ends up giving him his birthright. But Jacob just doesn't need the birthright. He needs the blessing also. So here is where Rebecca comes in. And Jordan was telling me yesterday about how mom was saying about how some rabbis say that, well, in essence, it really was supposed to be Jacob overall. You know, and you have this whole thing. Hmm? The prophecy is supposed to be Jacob. So if you go back to Genesis 25, 23, and I had just read that a few minutes ago, 
In the voice, it says, two nations are growing inside of your womb, and the two peoples will be divided in the future. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Yahweh said that to Rebekah beforehand, and he's telling her right then and there, the elder will serve the younger. So what does that mean? Esau will serve Jacob. The Amplified, like, well, I'm not going to read it again because I just read it, but it states it right there clearly. So that blessing from the beginning was intended for Jacob. But then you look at Rebekah. Now, Rebekah knows this, okay? So one day, Rebekah overhears Isaac calling for Esau. Isaac tells him that he fears he might die soon, and before he does, he wants to give him the blessing. So given also what we just read about how upset Isaac and Rebekah are about Esau's wives, okay, they're causing them bitterness and grief, you know, instilling this awfulness into their lives. So it's interesting, when you, when you read about that and you read about how upset he, they were over his marriages, it's hard to understand Isaac's motivation to want to give Esau the blessing even to begin with. Now, or his urgency in giving him the blessing, even more interesting is the fact that he called only one of his sons. Now, in tradition, when there was more than one son, they didn't just call the elder son, they called all the sons in to receive some type of blessing. Obviously, the elder got the firstborn blessing of stuff, but then the other sons got a type of blessing. So you would think that being on his deathbed, he would have, he would have called in Jacob also. But then you also read that Esau, I mean that um, Isaac favored Esau while Rebekah favored Jacob. Well, why was one of the reasons why Rebekah favored Jacob? Because she knew the prophecy that had been spoken over Jacob's life. And as a mother, she was guarding that prophecy. But even as a mother, when she saw what was happening, so to speak, she decided to take things in her own hands to make sure that that prop prophecy came to pass. So Rebekah overhears this conversation between Isaac and Esau. And obviously she remembers the promise Yahweh had given to her 40 years earlier. She knows that Yahweh's blessing is destined for Jacob. And she feels she has to do something to prevent it from going to the wrong son. You know, a lot, a lot of, when you look at the both sides of it, you have one side that looks at Rebecca and they kind of scorn her for, for doing that. They say, well, she, you know, she helped Jacob steal his blessing and all this. And then you look at the other side for other, other scholars or whatever you want to call them and say, well, no, go back and see what Yahweh said to Rebecca. Go back and see that he said to her plain out, the elder shall serve the younger. And Isaac wasn't doing anything about it. Okay, so that's when the mother came into play. Okay, there's, so, man, there's many who actually say that the line of the patriarchs should be Abraham, Rebecca, and Jacob. Because if it wasn't for Rebecca, Jacob would never have been the carrier of the promise. I was actually kind of going there. <laughs> so we'll never know why that she didn't. Actually, I shouldn't say never know. One day we are going to find out. But right now, we'll, we don't know why she didn't go to Isaac directly and tell him of the oracle given to her or at least remind him of it. So the question is, did she, when Yahweh spoke this to, to Rebecca, did she share it with, with Isaac? You know, did she share it with him or did she not share it with him? And if she did share it with him, why didn't she remind him of the prophecy that was spoken over Jacob? So however it seems, people often overlook the fact that Yahweh did tell Rebekah that Jacob would be the chosen one. He just said it, it's plain out. So her concern was the fulfillment of Yahweh's plan. And then this is the reason why she chooses to safeguard the blessing and maintain the link between Abraham and Jacob. It wasn't supposed to be the link between Abraham and Esau. It was supposed to be the link between Abraham and Jacob. And interesting, when you go further in and read, I think it might be in the very ending of the portion, but you see where Esau goes to Ishmael, so, which is very interesting in this whole self, and that's a whole other rabbit trail that I'm not going to go down right now. But in Rebecca's own way, she is working hand in hand with the patriarchs who responded to Yahweh's command. So like Jordan just said, that's the state. It was supposed to be Abraham, 
maybe not supposed to be, but they say it was supposed to be Abraham, Rebecca, and Jacob. So when you go back and look at that whole thing and you really research it, it, it shows it right there. Because of Rebecca, Jacob's status was secured. Because of Rebecca, Jacob received the blessing that was intended, what was supposed to happen. So I just wanted to paint that little picture of, of um, what took place between Jacob and Esau before I actually got into the thing I wanted to focus on. But the thing I wanted to focus on was the blessing. So what exactly is a blessing? So a blessing is an impartation to an individual that grants Yahweh's favor and protection. It brings well-being, support, good results, grants mercy. It's looked as a gift bestowed on an individual. Blessings suggest an intimate relationship between the blesser and the blessed. Now think of that. You know, it, it, it shows an intimate relationship. Think of when Yahweh bestowed a blessing upon Abraham. It was an intimate relationship. We already know that they had an intimate relationship, that there was a covenant made between Yahweh and Abraham. So blessings suggest an intimate relationship between the blesser and the blessed. blessed. A blessing is a decree for divine protection, divine favor, divine health, divine prosperity. But interesting, once the words, so, you know, when, when, when Esau says to, to uh, Isaac, well, bless me, bless me, you know, can you give me a blessing? Once those words were spoken over Jacob, you can't take back a blessing. Once the words of a blessing are spoken, it's too late to take them back. Those words were so important that he couldn't take them back. And now you could go off on another rabbit trail about, about words, but it is an example of the power of your words. There's power in the words of a blessing. Okay, when somebody bestows a blessing on another person, I mean, there's been many of us in here that have had a blessing spoken over us. You know, don't take that for granted. And in a minute, I'm gonna tell you why. And it was a revelation to me last night it was when I read it, but it was like, when, you're, when you have a blessing spoken over you and it's from the right individual and it's the right words, receive it, but hold on to it. Make it part of you, but also, if you're going to, now like in the case of Isaac, I mean, he was deceived, okay? He was old, he couldn't see well and stuff. But it gives you even more proof in situations where you gotta be careful what you say because there is power in our words. And the power of the words, they either help somebody or they hurt somebody. And we all know this, we've all been through the power of our words and how important words are on stuff. But so, according to this blessing that, that Jacob received, it was a blessing where he would be prosperous and powerful. The ancients believed that such prophetic blessings had the power to establish reality. Now think about that. They had the, the ancients believed that. They had the power to establish reality. Well, what do we know about our words? You know, when, our, you know, when Yahweh spoke and said, light be, reality took place and light was. And we've been given that same thing. There's power in our words. So just as in this, where they believed that that had the power to establish reality, we need to step into the position that when we speak a word, we believe that it has the power to form reality. Because that's what it's supposed to be. When you step into and you speak to, if there's cancer, by illustration only, in, some, in, in, some, in your body, you need to believe that the power of your word to curse that cancer in the root the roots of that cancer, to curse it, has the power to cause that to come into reality. And that's what a blessing is all about. So therefore, once spoken, those words couldn't be disavowed. So in essence, I was reading something else when I was doing a little more research in it. The blessing was like a covenant. It was like once you spoke a, a blessing over somebody, you were kind of forming a covenant with them. Because like what did I just say at the beginning? You know, it was an intimate relationship between the blesser and the blessed. So I want to read this to you that I came across last night. I don't recall the individual that wrote it, but it's called, it was called The Blessing. It says, Yahweh's intention and desire to bless humanity is a central focus of his covenant relationships. Two distinct ideas are present. First, a blessing was a public declaration of a favored status with Yahweh. Second, the blessing endowed power for prosperity and success. 
now this is one line that I wanted to focus on. In all cases, now listen to this carefully, because this is what gave me revelation last night. And I was just talking about when you receive a blessing, you know, someone speaks a blessing over you. It's just not just, oh, I, may you prosper and be in divine health as long as you live and, you know, you walk on. And that's it. The blessing served as a guide and motivation to pursue a course of life within the blessing. So think about that. When a blessing is spoken over you, it's supposed to serve as a guide and a motivation to you to walk in the way of that blessing, to make sure you pursue after what that blessing said about you, to walk out that course. So if that blessing was, you know, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, or may you be prosperous and walk in divine health all the days of your life. That needs to be a motivation and a guide for you to set your life in, in, a, in a course, in alignment, to make sure that that happens within your life, to make sure that that blessing comes to pass. pass. And when I read that, I thought, what a, what, a, uh, what a good way to get on track with something. What a good way to have a, a, a marker, so to speak, to guide you and be like, this is spoken over me, I'm going after this. And it is something that will motivate you. You spoke divine health and divine prosperity over me, then I'm gonna go for it. And that's how I'm gonna live my life so I have that manifested in my life. The Old Testament terms for blessing abound in the Old Testament, occurring over 600 times. I think it was pretty important, 600 times. The major terms are related to the word meaning to kneel, because in earlier times, one would kneel to receive a blessing. The history of Israel begins with the promise of blessing. The curse which had dominated the early chapters of the biblical stories in Genesis was countered by Yahweh's promise to Abraham that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The record of Israel's past is best understood as an outworking of blessing and cursing. You know, if you think about it, for me anyways, if a blessing is spoken over me, it gives me kind of like the, like I said, the motivation, but it gives me like the oomph to make sure I'm living right, to make sure that I'm living correctly. They give me that push to be like, oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe in this area I was making some wrong choices. But if that's what Yahweh is saying I can have, it's course correction. Blessing, in essence, gets you back on the right path and help you to stay there. The institutions of society, the family, government, and religion were, were the means by which ceremonial blessings were received. Within the family, the father blessed his wife and children. In the government context, the ruler blessed his subjects. Those who possessed a priestly role were bestowed with, bestowed with the privilege of blessing. The tribe of Levi was set apart to pronounce blessings in his Lord's name. Right, the tribe of Levi was actually set apart to pronounce blessings. Three common themes are present in formal Old Testament blessings. First, the greater blesses the lesser, a fact picked up by the writer of Hebrews to demonstrate the superiority of Melchizedek to Abraham. Second, the blessing is a sign of special favor that is intended to result in prosperity and success. Third, the blessing is actually an invocation for Yahweh's blessing. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful. In a less ceremonial sense, the scriptures declare a general blessing on the righteous. Those who are obedient to Yahweh's commands were, are blessed with affluence and victory. On the other hand, those who are disobedient are cursed and suffer the consequences of drought, disease, and deprivation. So remember, we know about the blessings and the cursings. You're either going to be blessed or you're going to either be cursed. You're either going to receive the blessings or you're going to receive the curses. It all depends on how you're walking, or how you're living, and the choices that you make. You know, the decisions that we made in the past are what define how they define where we're at today. Our choices that we make today are going to define what our tomorrow is going to be. But in essence, we sh you know, your past defines your destiny. But for some of us, we have allowed our past to define our destiny in the wrong way and what we thought our destiny should be. And we need to be focused on what Yahweh's destiny is for us. 
It is also possible for a person to bless Yahweh. This terminology arises as a response to the blessings bestowed by Yahweh. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits that we read in Psalms 103. These occurrences of bless are usually translated praise or extol in modern versions. The New Testament, the parallels between the Old and New Testament usages of blessing are striking. To be blessed is to be granted special favor by Yahweh with resulting joy and prosperity. In the New Testament, however, the emphasis is more on spiritual rather than on material blessings. Yahweh's promise to Abraham again serves as a foundation for blessings. The pledge that all peoples on earth shall be blessed is fulfilled in the person and work of, Ye of Yeshua. He has borne the consequences of the curse for believers and blessed them with the forgiveness of sins. Believers are blessed with every, every spiritual blessing in the Messiah and now inherit the blessings promised through the patriarchs. As a result of receiving Yahweh's blessings in Yeshua, believers are called to be a source of blessing to the world, especially in response to those who persecute them. Now think about that. How often do we just want to go up and be all lovey-dovey to somebody that's persecuted us, right? How often do we want to be a blessing to somebody that has stolen from us or lied to us continuously or cheated us or done whatever? Really? Really? You really want to go up and bless them? But it says right here that you're supposed to be a source of the blessing, especially in response to those who have persecuted you. And this is all word. There are so many scriptures. I'm just not saying them. But this is all word. It's in Luke. It's in Romans. It's in 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter, Isaiah. It's in Old and New Testament. We're supposed to be, you know, we're blessed to be a blessing. Remember how many times dad used to say that? We're blessed to be a blessing. We're not so supposed to just be blessed so that we keep it all for ourselves. We're supposed to be a source of blessing for others. In a general sense, the terms for blessing in the New Testament are used to designate that one is favored by Yahweh. Included among these are Yeshua, children, Mary, the disciples, those who have not seen and yet have believed, and those who endure trials. As in the Old Testament, when these words are ascribed to Yahweh, they are rendered praise. The most recognizable references to blessing come from the teachings of Yeshua, he declares that in spite of difficulties at the present time, the promises of Yahweh's salvation and coming kingdom bring a state of happiness and recognized favor with Yahweh. The culmination of the scriptures proclaims the end of the curse and the internal blessedness of the people of Yahweh. That's what is everything that makes up what a blessing is. That's what, you know, we're supposed to be walking in. That's about who we're supposed to be. You know, we're blessings in ourselves. You know how mom says, you know, we're ambassadors for Yeshua. You know, we're ambassadors of love. We're ambassadors of this. We're ambassadors of the blessing. We're carriers of the blessing. And that blessing is supposed to impact all that we come into contact with. So I was going to end with, we all know this very well. Justin puts it on for us after the service, to the song. But an aspect of thinking about what a blessing truly is and how you're supposed to use that blessing to be the, the guide, to motivate you to walk a correct course in life, to walk the life that Yahweh has called us to walk. So it's the blessing. And I'm going to read it in three different translations because I thought these three were just, you know, really powerful. But, you know, as I speak it, Take it as you, for yourself. You know, we do this at the end of, of remembrance when we pray and then we say, you know, may the Lord bless you and keep you. That's a blessing that's being bestowed upon you. And you're supposed to receive it, but not just for yourself, for others that you come in contact with. So when you hear these words in these different translations, you know, take them. Take them as your own. This is a blessing from Yahweh to you. Yahweh commanded Abraham to speak to Moses to speak these things over the people. This is a blessing that is for you. And we speak it every single Sabbath, but we've got to take it to heart. We've got to take it to reality because this is what we're supposed to be. So in the message, 
It says, Yahweh spoke to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the people of Israel. Say to them, God bless you and keep you. God smile on you and gift you. God look you full in the face and make you prosper. In so doing, they will place my name on the people of Israel. I will confirm it by blessing them. Tree of Life says, speak to Aaron and to his son saying, thus you are to bless Israel by saying to them, Adonai bless you and keep you. Adonai make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. Adonai turn his face towards you and grant you shalom. In this way they are to place my name over Israel so I will bless them. And then this is probably the first time I've ever, ever preached a scripture out of the King James Version, but it's a first time for everything, right? Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, you shall bless the children of Israel, saying to them, the the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. That is a blessing from Yahweh to each and every one of us. You know, he says there, you know, this was done back in the time with Moses and Aaron and stuff. But, you know, there is no time. It's all eternity. And it's past, present, future, all is one. So that blessing that was spoken over them is the same blessing that Yahweh is speaking over us now. And we've got to take that blessing. You know, the Lord bless you and keep you. What does that mean? You will be blessed in everything you put your hands to. That's word. Everything that you put your hands to shall prosper. And he shall keep you. What does that mean? He will keep you. He will protect you. He'll protect you from all things. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. He will protect you from deadly disease. He will protect you from any assaults of the enemy. He will protect you from, from, from pestilence and famine and car accidents. The Lord will keep you. That's the blessing. Yahweh will smile on you. Think about that right now. Yahweh is smiling on each and every one of us. That's by, he put that in the blessing. I'm smiling on you. Think of that, the creator of all things, the most high God, the God of Abraham and Rebecca and Jacob <laughs> is smiling on you. And he's gifting you. Well, some people may think, okay, oh, he's going to give me a pretty little wrapped up package on my birthday so that I can unwrap as a gift. No. He's gifting you each to do something special. We all have callings. Each one of us sitting in this room, from before we were born, Yahweh already knew the calling he was placed on our lives. Each one of us is gifted to do something mighty, gifted to do something special in and from Yahweh. He will look you full in the face and make you prosper. Think of that. Yahweh looking you full in the face Think of somebody that you're really close to and, and, and you know, when you're having a close, you know, somebody, a, a, a spouse or a best friend or a sister or whatever, and you're having a conversation with each other and they're looking you fully in the face. How do you feel when somebody's talking to you and they're looking you fully in the face? You know that they, you've got their utmost attention. You've got their 100% attention, that they're paying attention to you, that they're looking at you and and putting value in who you are. Yahweh is looking you full in the face, and he's making you prosper, not just in finances. He's making you prosper in your body. He's making you prosper in your, your happiness, in your family. In every area of your life, Yahweh is blessing us with prosperity. So think of that. Think of it when, you know, when you're you know, if you receive a blessing or even if we bestow a blessing on somebody else, you know, think about the words that are, you are speaking or are being spoken and receive them and use them to set your life in a course direction that could change it forever, that could manifest into things what Yahweh has promised. There's all these promises in his word that are for us. And like I said, The blessing is not just for us. We are blessed to be a blessing. So those of us that do OFT, do the food pantry, we have a blessing to bestow upon others. Just even by touching them and the words we speak over them is a blessing to give them. 
but you got to think that the blessing, those words are penetrating. What does mom say about touch? When you touch somebody, you're releasing something into them. Whatever is inside of you, you're releasing into them. And you got to on purpose think and imagine. It's not imagine, think and realize that it's permeating every cell of their body for whatever it is that they need at that time. And you don't have to know what it is that they need. He knows what it is. But you just remember how important the blessing is. And in that blessing that we just read, and when Jay plays it every day after, every, every day, every, he, maybe he does play it every day. He probably does, but every Sabbath after service, think of it in a whole new light. Think of the power of the words and the blessing, because those words are supposed to form reality. You know, and we are a blessed people. I think that, that we don't really realize how blessed we are. Just, number one, living in this nation. You know, I, I mean, out of all the nations in the world, you look at how much Americans have and how little they realize how blessed they are. Um, you know, and having just come through the Thanksgiving season, you know, we need to carry the attitude of thankfulness with us every day, not just on Thanksgiving. You know, we're supposed to continuously be offering up a, our Thanksgiving to Yahweh. But if what you're thankful for shows what you really value. Um, you know, in what she was talking about with Esau, he didn't value what he was gifted with. He didn't value the gift that Yahweh had given him when he was born as being the firstborn. He didn't value it enough to treat it with honor, to be thankful for it, to, to do in his actions things that lined up with who he really was. You know, he, he ends up going uh, on a course that was totally different from, from Abraham, his, his forefather, from Isaac. He chose a course of life that showed in every action he took that he was despising his, his blessing, that he was despising the birthright. So really, from the beginning, Esau had removed his own blessing from off of him. He, he was not positioning himself in such a place where he could, he could receive the blessing. You know, if you're, if you're always either just looking for what you can give, get, or if you're, if you're not appreciating what you have, you're putting yourself in a place to lose what you have. You know, what you don't value, you're in a position where you can lose it. You know, and, and that really is something that, that we want to take into our, our, our thinking and really do, what do we value in our lives? What, what do we place value upon? And especially the blessings we've been given. You know, each and every one of us have been given blessings, not just material blessings, but we've had words that were spoken over us. You know, in, in, in 1 Timothy 4, 14, it says, do not neglect the gift which is in you. It's the same, same thing as it, with Esau. It says he neglected his birthright. He neglected it. He didn't value it. He despised it. He treated it as nothing. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. Yahweh has put a gift inside each and every one of us that we are to use to bless humanity. Um, not only did he place the blessing upon Abraham and his, his children, his generations after him, he placed the blessing on Yeshua. It says that through Yeshua, the blessing of Abraham has now come upon us Gentiles, us who were not in a position to receive that covenant but it's been brought to us through Yeshua. But we, can't, we, we have to not neglect the gift that is in us. And it says it was the gift that was imparted to him by prophetic utterance when the elders laid their hands upon you. I think, uh, think through your life of, of times when you may have been in a service where Mary Fran or someone else laid their hands upon you or spoke a word over you. Those are the words we need to hold on to. There's another scripture in there that says that those prophecies those words, you could say the words of blessing, are by which we wage our war. You know, they're, they're our ammunition. They give us, like she said, that motivation, the guide to line up our lives with that. If we know that we're called to, we've been gifted to do something, if we know that we've been blessed with something, then we need to get our lives in alignment with that. And, and, and everything else should line up with it. And so... I want to kind of take a little bit of a, a journey here, um, but I want to, it's all going to weave together here, but we're, we've just stepped up into the month of Kislev, as I had said, and Kislev is a significant month. Uh, every month is significant, 
but there's a lot in this month that if we tap into it, will will be brought to another level. Will be brought up higher. Um, so just kind of initially, Kislev means trust, security, and hope. There's different variations of this word that are used throughout the Old Testament in Hebrew. Um, the tribe is the tribe of Benjamin, which is the tribe, which is the, he was the one who was most gifted with the bow. He was an archer. Therefore, the, the, sign, the, the sign in the heavens is Sagittarius, which is the archer. So there's a connection between the archer. You think of an archer stands at a distance and they try to hit a mark. They're trying to hit a target. Um, and what, is, what do we know that sin is? Missing the mark. So our, our goal in life is to be a good archer. We want to always be hit, hitting the mark that Yahweh has put in front of us to be, to be getting that bullseye, so to speak, getting, getting right in the center of his plan for us. Um, the letter for this month is the Samach, which Samach is, is formed in the shape of a circle. So it means to trust, to support, or coming full circle. Um, and it's interesting because this month is called the month of dreams. It's called the month of light. Well, how can it be called the month of light? Because it's the darkest month of the year. But in the midst of the darkness, the light shines. And that's, that's what we want to focus on. Um, Kislev and Tevet, the ninth and 10th months of the Hebrew calendar, are the darkest months of the year in the northern hemisphere. But the light always gives in the midst of it. Uh, Kislev is a month with a very special meaning. If you take the Hebrew word kiss, the Hebrew word kiss means pocket. The Hebrew word lev means heart. So put them together and you kind of get a little piece of poetry, pocket of your heart. So it's like, what does that mean? Kislev asks us to reach deep down inside and close a hand around our heart's desires. Bringing these out into the light is the beating heart of Kislev. Now is the time to rekindle our dreams. Why is it that the month of Kislev is called the month of dreams? Because the Torah portions throughout this month, there's 10 different dreams that are named in the Torah, in all of the five, first five books of the Bible. There are 10 dreams that are named. In this month alone, nine of those dreams appear in the Torah portions. So it's the month of dreams. Well, what is a dream? You know, you think about Martin Luther King, I have a dream. But is a dream something that is important? You know, I think as you, as you get older, dreams kind of seem like they're not as important to people. You can think of a child when they're dreaming about what they're going to be like when they're older, what they're, what they're going to be when they grow up. But at some point in life, it seems like adults stop dreaming. Is that how it's supposed to be, though? Or are we all supposed to still have dreams? Uh, last month in Heshvan, we were in the muck, so to speak, sifting through the hardship of after the, the fall feasts. We were hustling hard to make good on our resolutions. This challenge reflected in the story of the flood. So we know that last month is when the rain started and they ended in Heshvan as well. Not loving the direction humanity was headed, Yahweh sent powerful rains to, to wipe the slate clean, but a few made it out. Noah, his family, and all the animals lived in an ark, waiting for God to dry up the land. Plenty of time for them to reach down into their heart's pockets and take a good look at what was inside. What happened after the flood was just as important. Yahweh sent a rainbow, hope. And this is a month of hope as well. It's a month of miracles. It's a month of hope. It's a month of light. It's a month where we focus, it's our cho choice what we're going to focus on. The darkness, what's going on in the world around us, or are we going to focus on the light? In the new month of Kis Kislev, we enter a time of miracles and gain the ability to see the full spectrum of light all the more brightly as winter comes on. Kislev offers a healing quality of sleep. In Jewish thought, sleep is the time when our souls ascend to a higher world and see the light. And speaking of light, this month we also celebrate Hanukkah. How can Hanukkah already be almost here? Which is all about bringing light to dark moments and rejoicing in miracles. Combining the themes of illumination and vision, our spiritual teachers say Kislev is an auspicious month to meditate on life's purpose. What is the purpose of our lives? Why are we here? 
to move past our own limiting beliefs. You know, how many times do we talk about this, but the Israelites kept themselves out of the land because they believed that they were grasshoppers in the sight of everybody else. So many times we put a ceiling on our own, our own abilities because we cap it based on our beliefs of ourselves, how we see ourselves, how we see our abilities. Um, and it's a month to receive guidance about how to live fully. Well, you use the blessing as your guidance and you align yourself with that. Each person walks through the world with a passion, dream, and desire to make an impact. I think in, inside of every person, there is a desire to do something significant, to make an impact, to, to do something that's meaningful. Nobody wants to live a meaningless life. Nobody sets out their, their life and says, I just want to live a life that has no value and I don't do anything that's, that's good. No, nobody, nobody has that. Inside of our very DNA, I think, Yahweh has planted in us the desire to make an impact. Um, but somewhere, somehow, we get tripped up by self-doubt or fear of rejection or failure. Our untapped potential leaves us depressed and shackled to pessimistic minds and scared egos. During Kislev, we're commanded to have faith to follow our hearts and move forward, even if we can't make out a clear path. A funny thing, faith. We can't really comprehend it. Faith desires pure presence. Your faith desires the presence of Yahweh more than anything. Faith asks us to step forward with trust and fearlessness. And Kislev, challenge yourself to move beyond logic and keep your eyes open for miracles along the way. Find a way to move forward. Stop looking for excuses about why you can't. The mind desperately wanting to understand seeks answers. Kislev urges us to try something different. Take a break from thinking. Think of, um, yeah, I think of, I think of Chosen when, when uh, Rama says to Thomas, maybe for once in your life, don't think. You know, like some, some, some of us are so, can be so analytical about things and like, Think of how, how, how we can logically understand it. Sometimes logic gets in the way. Sometimes you just don't think. Take a, a break from thinking and drop into the park, pocket of the heart. Think from your heart. You know, you're, you're supposed to be led by your, your heart, not your head. Um, but as we come into to, to this month, Let's really take account of what we have, what we, what we have as blessings, what we have in our lives that Yahweh has given us, and how do we now go forth and bless others? You know, the menorah is an interesting thing, you know, when you have the Hanukkah. The tradition is to set the Hanukkah at, at a window or the door of your house so that it's shedding light to the outside, so that people who are driving by can see it. We, we have a different tradition. We have a big Hanukkah in our yard that's lit up at night, but it's something that's not just supposed to be for us. You don't put it on the table in your kitchen where nobody outside can see it. You put it where others can see it, so you're shedding light into the darkness. The light is always supposed to be going into the darkness to dispel the darkness. The darkness, darkness cannot put out the light. We know that. But it has to be shown into the darkness for it to be effective. You know, you can have a flashlight in your pocket, but you can walk around the yard stumbling over everything. It doesn't do you any good unless you turn on the light and use it to dispel the darkness. Um, Keshvan is the month where Noah entered the ark, but then it's also the month where they exited the ark, beginning with Kislev. They see the rainbow, the sign of hope, the sign of something new. And it was a covenant. Yahweh established his covenant with them at that moment. Can, I, I imagine, can you imagine what Noah and his family experienced when they stepped off of that ark after that year? I mean, can you imagine just in the natural? I mean, <laughs> I think it's actually not humorous, but it's interesting that we paint our nurseries, you know, like a child's nursery with like, Noah's Ark and these really cute things. Well, what about all the bodies that were floating around in the water around them? What about the fact that all of humanity was just destroyed and the earth was completely wiped out? Nobody really focuses on that when they're making these cute little things on children's walls. <laughs> but in a reality, what was it that, that Noah and his family stepped out of the Ark into? A world that they were literally the only ones in existence. 
what could have come across their minds? I mean, the, the opportunity for fear. It's a really a big world out there, you know, and I'm alone, really alone in this world. Um, but they realized that, that, you know, okay, we've been saved from this flood, but all humanity has been wiped out. But immediately Yahweh greets them with a rainbow. What is that a sign of? His covenant promise that he will never do that again. What is the fear when you've experienced something in your life, whatever it is, traumatic, whatever, whatever you may have walked through, what is the fear that comes after it, that that's going to happen again, that could happen again, you know, and, and that can be something that can hinder people in, in reality as they try to move forward in their life, they're always dragged back by that. Yahweh answered that fear right away when they step off that boat. He said, that will never happen again. You're never going to have to go through that again. And here's my sign of the promise. You know, I, I, I imagine that was a, such a comfort for them to see that. And then even, even after that fact, every time it rains and they saw the rainbow, they're reminded, you're never ha going to have to go through that again. He, it's over. That, you know, like, like it says in Habakkuk, affliction shall not rise up a second time. You, and that answers their fears. But it's a promise that has been given. And that promise is something that they were to hold on to to move forward. They're supposed to align their lives with that promise. And sometimes there's been promises that have been given to us. I mean, just look at, look at the whole thing with um, even Isaac and Rebecca. How many years was it that, that Rebecca was believing for a child? Was it 20? But Rebecca was praying for, for a child for 20 years, but she held on to a promise. That promise gave her the strength, gave her the motivation to keep moving forward. Same thing with Abraham and Sarah. They were given a promise, and how many years did it take them to see the fulfillment of that promise? Yahweh always comes through on his promises if you don't quit, if you don't give up, if you hold on to that promise and line up your life with it. Hebrews 10, 35 through 36 says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. There's a reward at the end of it. You're going to get a, you're getting a blessing because of it. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So when you have done the will of God, then you receive what is promised. If you're aligning your life with him and lining up with him, that's when you receive the promise. Um, this article that I found said, lately I've witnessed so many people settling for less whether in life, love, relationships, or even in their walk with God. It's almost if, as if every disappointment they've experienced has taken root and blocked their view of the wonderful blessings that lie ahead. You get so focused on the past things that have happened that you lose the ability to look forward, to think about the future with any sense of hope and positivity. Not only has fear set in, but complacency as well. The desire to pursue the promises of God has become buried deep under the pain they have encountered. Many have stopped believing that God will perform what he has promised. And that's a sad thing because that's when you won't receive what he's promised, when you stop believing. If you've stopped believing, if you've stopped dreaming, it's likely that you've also lost the drive to live life vigorously and with much enjoyment. You notice somebody who's lost their vision, who's lost their dream, and nothing's really enjoyable to them anymore. The Bible says that when there's no vision or clear direction from the Lord, the people perish. We lose the passion to live when, as in Ecclesiastes 1.14, life becomes a chasing after the wind. You know, same old, same old, doing the same routine, like a hamster in a wheel, just running and running and running and running, and there's nothing else to be enjoyed in life. If you find yourself in a similar place, you need to dream again. It's not the time or the place for you to quit and throw in the towel. There's so much more in store for you. I know from experience, it's hard to see the forest for the trees, but if you take a step back and re-examine your life, you may get a different perspective on where you are currently. That's why it's so important to be thankful for the things that you have in your life. You know, stop and really take Take accountability, if, like take account of what you have. What do you have to be thankful for? Well, the breath that's in your lungs for one, you know, the, that you have a roof over your head and think of the people down in Haiti who, who don't 
hardly even have a roof over their head. Those type of things can not only spark more thankfulness in you, but it gets you to starting to look forward and say, wow, it's really not as bad as the enemy tries to make it seem, you know? Um, Isaiah 43 says, this is what God says, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert, be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. How has God shown himself faithful to you? Have you witnessed his, his grace in difficult seasons in your life? His sustaining power? What good can come out of this season you find yourself in now? Don't give up. You have need of patient endurance. This is a time to refocus and begin again. Trust that God is with you and he will not fail you. He's never failed you in the past. He never will fail you. He's the one person that you can trust. When everybody else, it was, I saw that there's a, I think it's actually a song. You're the one who, who, who steps into my life when the whole world walks away. Doesn't matter who has walked out of your life, he's always there and he will never fail you. Uh, dreaming helps us formulate new strategies and allows for maximum capacity of creativity as we pursue new frontiers. We will pioneer and make, take new territory in the spirit and in the natural. It's time to dream with abandon once more and stir hope for what is yet possible and build what hasn't yet existed. I, I realized in my life that there were areas in my thinking where past disappointments or the longevity of the battle had put a ceiling on my ability to dream and hope. Perceived failures, disappointments, and battle weariness had dampened passion and expectation of profound good. Some areas in my heart needed a hope upgrade. In fact, many people in the body who have walked through delay and prolonged challenges are living not just with a hope deficit, but a hope avoidance. I thought that was interesting. Not, there's not just a deficit of hope, but they're avoiding hope. Uh, this made positioning and planning for the new almost impossible as our expectation of good has been minimized or completely exhausted. We've learned to keep our expectations in check and within doable borders, not allowing the thrill of imagining and dreaming with God for fear of further disappointment. So if you're in a place where there's been stuff that's gone on and you, you're not just in a hope deficit, but you're avoiding hope, better to not dream than to be disappointed again. That can be the tendency that, that, that the enemy tries to get us to think. But then we're hindering ourselves. We're hindering ourselves from fulfilling what Yahweh has called us to fulfill. The solution for kickstarting our hearts, it's time to dream again. We are in a season of accelerated change and new frontiers of possibility and potential are needed in every sphere of society. Faith expectations are being upgraded and stretched. Dreaming is restoring your passion, your heart, your hope, and your voice. There's an invitation to lay aside past disappointments, failures, staleness, and things that didn't happen as you'd hoped, and simply dream again, hope again. Let Yeshua restore your pioneering spirit as the act of dreaming stimulates your capacity for new. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this, Ephesians 3.20. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Um, I, then I found this article that was actually on Andrew Womack's ministry, and the woman who wrote it wanted to, to read this. I have a dream, she begins. Those powerful words by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. never cease to stir me. I hear his iconic voice reverberating with passion and remember his, his dedication to that dream in the face of terrible injustice. And yet I wonder if I really understand the meaning of those words. Am I living with purpose? Is there something that compels me, something within me that ignites my imagination and stirs my willingness to face hardship and persecution? Do I have a dream? We need to each ask that of ourselves. Do I have a dream? I remember as a teenager being asked that question. It seemed that nearly everyone had plans and dreams for their future and everyone else wanted to know mine. 
But at that time in my life, I didn't have a dream. I was just trying to survive. Eventually though, those questions began to rise back up in my spirit. I began to remember. I remembered what it was like to dream as a child. Sitting at the top of my swing set at dusk, I'd watch in awe as God drew the curtains of a day once more. And I remembered how natural it was to fellowship with him, how big and how capable he made me feel, and yet how small I was. And I began to dream. Sometimes you gotta re-stir up those, those memories from the past of when you did dream. I dreamed that God would restore the years that the locust had eaten, that one day I would love and trust someone without he hesitation or fear. I dreamed that in spite of what happened to me, I would walk out of those nightmares and into my future with confidence and peace. Now here I am 15 years later, God has fulfilled all those dreams. And I walk in his confidence and peace. The nightmares are but a fleeting memory with scars that are nearly indiscernible. I was listening to Andrew Womack's teaching on lessons from Joseph recently and felt God stirring me again. Andrew said, God has a purpose for every one of you. It's not up to you to pick and choose what you want to do. God has a design for your life. You can't just do your own thing and ask God to bless it. See, you, a lot of people do that. They try to run out and to do something, God bless me. No, why don't you find what he's told you to do? You gotta find out what God's purpose for your life is. Your talents, your skills, where you live, the time you were born, everything about you was created by God. It was designed for a specific purpose. I know the things that I dreamed were part of God's plan for me. He has made me an overcomer and it's time to start dreaming again. My three-year-old grandson has no problem dreaming big dreams. When, I, when you ask him what he wants to be when he grows up, he shouts with every ounce of enthusiasm in his perpetually jumping body, I wanna build bridges, I wanna fly an airplane, and I wanna go to the North Pole. You know, we, we see children around us all the time who are so excited about what they wanna be when they grow up. Why is it that the young have no problem dreaming dreams that are charged with adrenaline and laced with human impossibility? because they, they haven't had enough time to live to have people squash down their dreams. You know, they, they think of how, when they, you're young, you can look at it and they're like, they're dreaming something that's impossible, that's never gonna happen. Well, let them, let them dream, let them have imagination. Imagination is sadly lacking even in young people nowadays. But it seems that as the years go by, men and women often lose the capacity to dream. Life has a way from, of stealing from our very souls the rich delight of being able to dream a new dream, uh, to hope with unlimited expectation and to look ahead with soaring vision. John 10.10 10 says, the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I never really saw that scripture in that light before. You know, you tend to think of the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy things from your life, your health, whatever. But the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy your dream. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy your destiny. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy your purpose. He's the one who comes to try to steal the very life out of you that Yahweh planted in you to do something for him. But Yahweh came, Yeshua came, that we could have that life reborn inside of us that the enemy can't steal that from us anymore. A three-year-old lives a life awash in hope and expectation while a 60-year-old slugs through the swamp of regret and pessimism. A six-year-old can't wait for school to end to learn how to ride a bike and to have dessert. I mean, think of how excited children just get about dessert. A 50-year-old sometimes dreads the next birthday, forgets the joy of youthful enthusiasm and ponders the mistakes of the past. Why is it the disappointments of life steal the raw pleasure of outrageous and hopeful expectation from the human soul. Paul says in Philippians 3.13, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal to the prize of the high calling of God in Yeshua. It's time to dream again. It's time to look forward to all that God desires to do in you and through you. Dreams were never intended to be the playground of only the young, but the dreaming of dreams and the capacity to embrace vision has been given to all of humanity, young or old, as a lifelong gift from the Father of all eternity. 
Perhaps tragedy or disappointment has caused your soul to petrify with no desire to look ahead or dream about tomorrow. Perhaps the reality of living in the same old, same old for too many years has pickpocketed your youthful hopes and childhood enthusiasm. If you do nothing else today, take the advice of Paul and forget the things which are behind. Just forget about what happened in the past. Forget the failures, forget the disappointments, forget the years of famine and dryness, forget the criticism, forget the pain. You see, forgetting about the past always precedes reaching forward to what lies ahead. If you're stuck in regret and backward thinking, you'll never dream another dream or set another goal. Do not remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. See, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not be aware of it? The plans and purposes of God in your life does not come with an expiration date attached. There's no expiration date on his plans, his promises, his purposes. If you've lost all hope of making any kind of difference for Yeshua and his kingdom, perhaps it's time for you to hope again. The ability to hope always begins with the commitment to ponder the past no longer. The day has come to resolutely determine that the past holds no enticement for our thought life or for our emotions. Don't give it any, any, any real estate in your thoughts. Don't give it any real estate in your emotions. God, the greatest father in all of eternity past or all of eternity yet to come, never intended the dreaming of dreams to be the nutrition of childhood. This is a season when all are called to dream with enthusiasm and with wisdom. In the last days it shall be, says God, that I pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. In Acts 2.17. So I kind of wanted to, to, to focus on that for a moment where it can seem to be that you can... So this time of year, people think, oh, it's the most wonderful time of the year. But for some, it's not the most wonderful time of the year. For some, there's been things that have happened in their life. For some, they're walking through situations. I know through the past two years of the pandemic, there was so much with that that took, really drained the hope out of so many people and, and removed from them any source of like family getting together, all this stuff that gave them a sense of meaning in an already dark time of the year. You know, there's already seasonal stuff that's going on and people can be affected by that. But how do we make whatever time of year it is the most wonderful time of the year for us? How do we make what we're walking through, how do we make our life the most wonderful life possible? How do we, you know, thinking of that, that old movie, I'm sure many of you have seen it, It's a Wonderful Life. And, and there's so many lessons in that movie that, that, that we can grab a hold of if anybody hasn't seen it, but George Bailey is the, is the, the man in the, in the movie, and he has a life that he's not sure he wants. Talking about being gifted with something, your gifted life, but he doesn't know that he want, if he wants his life. He, his life has started falling apart, he's in debt, he was about to lose his business, his livelihood, he's facing prison for something he hadn't even done. So his life is literally going spiraling down. And so his family is facing poverty, it's facing shame. And he comes to this point where he, he's so desperate, he goes to his arch enemy, Mr. Potter, and he's pleading to him for a loan for his life insurance. So he's like, so desperate, I'm gonna take out a loan on my life insurance. And Potter says to him, George, you're worth more dead than alive. Again, talking about the significance of words that we speak to other people. What words, what did that have an effect in his mind? So because this is, he realizes I'm worth more dead than alive, he decides the only solution is to take his life and supply his family at least with money to be able to carry on from his life insurance. But in the movie, God sends this angel. By the way, the theology is not correct in this movie as far as their, their idea of angels. Angels are not people who are sent to have, who die and go to heaven and then are sent back to earth to earn their wings. Don't know where they got that from. But anyways, <laughs> so this angel is sent to stop him before he can take his life. And so he says, you know, but how do you, how do you convince a man who, who thinks that what he has as a gift of life is 
is something to throw away. How do you convince a man who thinks that that the gifts he has are too valuable to throw away, too valuable to be destroyed? So in here, the answer is, I'm going to give you your request and make it as if you were never born. I'm going to let you walk through life as if you had never even been born. And what would the world be like if you hadn't been born? If you had asked him that question, he probably would have said it wouldn't have mattered. Like my life doesn't matter, nothing matters, I'm, I'm broke and nobody cares about me and all this stuff. There could have been an answer of all this stuff. But as he starts walking through town, he discovers some interesting things. The town he had worked so hard to build up and protect became a den of iniquity and evil because he wasn't there. The pharmacist who George saved from a tragic mistake has become the town drunk. And he's shocked about that. His brother Harry, who he saved from falling through the ice, had died because George wasn't there to save him. And hundreds of men died that Harry would have saved during the war, but he wasn't there to save them. He finds out that the m woman he married and had wonderful children with had ended up becoming dejected and a lonely spinster. And it's too much for him to take. He finally understood how wonderful his life had been because he was allowed to see how much would have been lost if he, if he had never been born. You know, I think we need to step back and take a real hard look at our lives and say, what would it have been like if I hadn't been in here? If, 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 if I hadn't even been in this situation, what could have turned out differently for all the people that are around you, all the people that you do impact, all the people that you have had something in their life? Even if it was just a, a word that you gave them that saved them. What if you weren't there? What if you were never even there in their life? Um, you know, a similar scene is shown in Chosen. And it's when Mary falls back into her old life. You know, and, and Peter, um, Simon, and, and Matthew go. And they go to get her back. And she's in this place where she's seeing herself as beyond redemption. I've gone too far this time. He redeemed me once. I can't, I can't go back. I can't face him. I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. And they begin to show her that her passion is what caused, them to, caused Matthew to start studying the Torah. And she's teaching Rama to read. And she was the catalyst for a paralyzed man to be able to be healed. And she realized she's helping people in ways she didn't even notice. And I think that's the case for all of us. If we really could see from Yahweh's perspective, I think that there are people that we've impacted in our lives that we haven't even realized we, we've impacted. And if we weren't there, their life would be totally different. Totally different. Unfortunately, too many people have been duped by the idea that a wonderful life or a positive life would mean that there are no consequences and no challenges. And this culture is a big example of that. They practice excessive liberties. Go out and do what you want. Do whatever you want. But the reality is there are consequences in life. There's, there's consequences to choices. There's things that, that, that are in place as laws of nature that we can't violate. You know, many of you have heard of Ernest Hemingway, you know, of his writings and stuff. Um, what is often overlooked and ignored about his life is how he used his fame and fortune to aggressively pursue after pleasures of all kinds. He, he's well known for not having any appreciation for the Bible, not much less moral standards. He had no standards in his life, and, and he pursued the good life with a vengeance. But sadly, all of his involvement with all of his pleasure-seeking could not fulfill him, and he ended up taking his own life in the end. That, all that's out there, will not fulfill you. No matter how you start chasing after what you think would be a wonderful life, some of the richest people in the earth are the most unhappy people because they realize, I've gotten to the end, I've bought everything that money can buy, I've done, all, I've done it all, I've seen it all, and nothing's filling this hole inside of me. It's because all you need is Yahweh. Even with the world, darkness that's trying to swallow us and the world and the enemy trying to discourage us, we need to rejoice in our salvation and enjoy every day God has given us on this earth. Live life, it's a choice. Mom always says that. It's a choice. You get up, it's a choice to praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all those within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. Don't forget what he's done for you. 
Don't forget to thank him for all he's given you. And that's what opens the door for the blessings to flow. That's what opens the door for you to actually experience living life as it's supposed to be. That's when it says in Proverbs, you have a continual feast regardless of the circumstances. It says in Psalm, Psalm 23 that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Doesn't say he removes the enemies and then you can feast. No, you, he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Right in the midst of what's going on, you choose joy, you choose hope, you choose expectation, you choose to dream, you choose to look beyond where you're at in your current situation and see what Yahweh has for you. Looking beyond, looking above, looking, looking from his perspective. You know, he said his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He's saying that because he wants us to think on his level. I can see things. I can see exactly how it's going to, to, to be laid out. Jeremiah talks about that he has plans to prosper us and not to harm us. His plans, if we align ourselves with his plans, his blessing, what he's given us, then that will put us in a place where we're going to step out of the circumstances that the enemy, it gives us, it's the key that unlocks the prison doors. It's the key that, that breaks the chains that the enemy's been trying to put on you. In the midst of the darkness, the light came as a seed. Yeshua was born during Sukkot, we believe. He was conceived during Hanukkah. Let's turn over to John chapter one as we begin to wrap this up. John one, starting at verse one, in the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God Himself. He was present originally with God. All things were made and come into existence through Him, and without Him was not even one thing made that has come into being. In Him was life, and the wonderful life is in Him. The life was the light of men, and the light shines on in the darkness, for the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out, or absorbed it, or appropriated it, and is unreceptive to it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came to witness that he might testify of the light that all men might believe and adhere to and trust in and rely upon it through him. He was not the light himself, but came that he might bear witness regarding the light. There it was. The true light was coming into the world, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light that illumines every person. He came into the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which belonged to him, to his own, to his domain, creation. And they who were his own did not receive and did not welcome him. But to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. You know, every, I don't care how many times you read this passage, it just stirs stuff inside of you. But in the midst of the darkness, the light came. What if Yeshua had not been sent? You know, thinking along the lines of, of George Bailey, what if Yeshua had not been sent? What if Yeshua had never come into this world? What if Mary hadn't been willing? What if he had never been conceived? What if he was never born? What if God had not given his only son to offer salvation? There would be no angel telling Mary that she would give birth. There would be no uh, Messiah, no preparing the way by John the Baptist. There would be no disciples. There'd be no miracles, no followers of the way, no early church. There would be no fulfillment of the Torah, no salvation available by grace through faith in him. Where would we be? It would literally be the death of us all eternally if Yeshua had not come. We would have no hope, no help, no salvation from the punishment each of us deserves because we would be hopeless, helpless sinners if Yeshua had not come. We would be stuck in a chaotic, selfish, sinful world, dead in trespasses and sins, and would only have the option to follow the way of the world and the prince of the power, the heir, the devil. We would always satisfy the passions of our flesh, carrying out our unholy desires. And because of this, our nature would have stayed the same, children of wrath. Think of how he says in Ephesians, you were once this way. 
There would be no opportunity to become right with God, to become children of God, but praise God, he did provide his son. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with the Messiah. By grace, you have been saved. So what are the dreams that you need to have conceived inside of you? What are the dreams you need to rekindle in your hearts this month? What are the dreams that God gave you that are part of your destiny? And through situations and circumstances, disappointments, you let go of that dream, maybe even forgot it. Maybe it's been so buried you don't even remember the dream. What blessings were given to you? What prophetic words were spoken over you? And the enemy came and tried to steal that word, to abort that seed before it was birthed. What are those things? It's never too late. It's never too late to resurrect those things. In the midst of the darkest time of the year, as darkness is covering the earth and spiritual darkness is covering all the people, it's time to arise and shine. It's time to throw off the past. It's time to forget about what's happened and leave it behind. Our light has come. In this month of darkness, the celebration of light and miracles and dreams. It's what we choose to focus on. And then the tide turns. When you start dreaming, when you start hoping, when you start believing in him, that's when the tide turns. And the light starts gaining momentum, just like it will at the end of this month. Think of it, it's the darkest month, but at the end of the month, we start gaining light back. It reverses the darkness. Because that, we really can praise him because he has given us a wonderful life. He really has. We are blessed people, and we need to not forget what he's done for us. We need to not be like Esau who despised what he was given and lost it forever. But we need to be those who hold on to the promises and hold on to it and pursue what he's given inside of our hearts. And no matter at what stage you are in life, no matter where you might have left off, pick back up what your dream was. Pick back up what he implanted in you, maybe when you were a child, but pick it back up and run with it because it's never too late to pursue it. Amen. Thank you for those of you who joined us today. We trust you've gotten something out of this message that you're going to be able, begin to be able to stir up the dreams that you had, to begin to follow Yahweh into places that you, you've never even expected, and watch him do the miraculous in your life. We'll see you on Tuesday night. Until then, you have a blessed weekend.